everyone. Welcome to the Community Classroom. This is Dr. Tracy McCarthy, psychologist, attorney, and educator. What we're going to be doing is we're going to look at the passenger list from the 1600s to the 1900s, identifying the individuals who were known by surnames that were variations of Negro. And so we're going to be looking at the Negro passenger list. And perhaps you might find variations of these names in your own family in terms of surnames or other individuals that you might know. And we're going to start off looking at, of course, the deconstruction of Negro. So we're going to look at the meaning of the surname and the history of the surname. And then we're going to get into some archival research. This is actual library research. Uh, so we're going to get into some archival research so that you can actually see the source data for these passenger lists. Now, there are many people who are asserting that the name Negro uh, came as an identifier or a misidentifier for those who identify as American Indian. But what you're going to see is that the word Negro uh, comes from Europe and it was applied to those who actually had this surname. And so, yes, it was also identified with a phenotype. So we're going to look at that, too. One of the things you're cautioned to do is there are a lot of individuals uh, on the internet who are stylizing themselves as educators, teachers, researchers, historians, all of that. Uh, when those individuals refuse to show you their sources uh, for the data that they are asserting, then it becomes questionable. So they need to be able to show you all of the data. So if someone claims that 98% of individuals who are identified as Negro in America or in the Americas, those individuals are actually American Indian. Those individuals need to actually provide the verifiable data for that. Now, many people are asserting that they don't need to do that and all of the data is just trickery coming from academia. However, you need to see that data. And so a person's word is not sufficient. And you also need to know that the data is coming from those individuals and not from someone else, perhaps those people in academia that perhaps they got it from. Um, and so you do need to see the sources for the data so that you can then go and check it for yourself. So any assertion that's made about data, then you should have the ability to go and check it out for yourself. And this is not about having a particular degree. This is plain old common sense. And so when individuals are presenting information, they cannot show you the sources for it. Uh, it becomes problematic. And as always, if this appears on anything other than Dr. Tracy McCarthy, it is stolen and unauthorized. Some individuals ask why that statement comes with all of the videos. Part of that has to do with videos being stolen from the community classroom. And so you can see here, uh, it becomes a big issue because once the video is stolen, it becomes a major legal issue and some individuals turn it into a major legal battle. And so you can see when the copyright notice has been issued in prior times, that individuals or channels such as Wake Up Indigenous Niji or American Indian Truth, that's the other name, uh, they file counter notices. And so it becomes a battle for the material that you have created that they want to uh, then commandeer. So uh, the copyright notice is out there so that people are given fair warning related to the copyrighted material. And we're going to start with a look at the Passenger and Immigration List Index. Now, these are large books that are in the reference section at some libraries. You need to go to a large library, and so you would need to check with the library before you make a trip to the library to make sure that they have the books. And these volumes go on and on for years, and so, again, they are huge books. But you can copy things at the library. So you can't check the books out, but you can actually make copies.
And we are going to start off with a deconstruction of the name Negro or Negro, depending on how you're pronouncing it. And what you can see, the first thing they start off with is it is recorded in over 50 spellings. And so depending on what language you're talking about, there are over 50 variations of this particular surname. And what you can see down here is it does literally mean dark or black. And so you can see that that is the meaning of the word so that when you see the variations of it, regardless of what language you're talking about, whether you're talking about French or English or Italian, you'll know that this is what they are talking about. And one thing you can also see is there's a notation that there are over a dozen coats of arms granted to this surname. And here you can see notations related to the spelling variation. So there are additional spelling variations that you can see so that you can get a better idea. You can see Negri, Negro, Negra, Negrelli, Negrato, Negrello, Negroni, a variety in terms of the N-E-G and N-E-G-R. And you can see down below, and this is just for this particular source, you can see that two individuals immigrated into the United States or into America, into the Americas as settlers in the 17th century, very early on. Again, these are settlers. And so you have one coming into Virginia, 1635, and then you have another one coming into Maryland, uh, 1648. Now it's really interesting to note this because again, this is also where you have significant numbers of what you would consider Indian tribes. And so you have these individuals coming from Europe, even with this surname, and then that name also ultimately being applied to a number of individuals who might identify as American Indian. But again, these individuals were settlers in that area. And before we get started looking at the passenger list, we want to look at another notation. And so this surname is not just in America. It's not just in the United States. And you can see here under HebrewSurnames.com, there's an identification for Niger or Niger. And you can see this is apparently a common surname for a number of individuals with Hebrew identity. And you can see this is primarily, this is Argentina. But you can see off to the right that these individuals were born in a number of other places. And let's get started with the passenger and immigration list. So we're going to just jump right in. Now, this is just from a couple of volumes and so there are many more that you can look at at the library and they span a number of years and so here you can see just starting right off we have a number of names uh, you have Francisco Negrovernus and this is in 1835 and then you have uh, the Negrish family so you have that individual going into Manitoba you have individuals going into Quebec with this surname, Negrillo or Negrillo, depending on how you're pronouncing that, going into Peru. This is 1590. And so the majority are between the 1600s and the uh, 1900s. However, there are some outliers that came very, very early. So this is an extremely early uh, notation here. And then you see the one for August, looks like August Negro going into Virginia, 1635. You see Joaquin going into Puerto Rico, 1839. Uh, and this is just the straight name Negro for these individuals. Then you have Phyllis and Dina going into Maryland. Again, settlers, 1648, 1637. Uh, you have Maria Negroes going into Maryland, 1664. Another one, Robert Francis going into Maryland. So Maryland was a hotbed, if you will, uh, in terms of a location for individuals coming in with this surname Negro or Negroes. You can see Negroni going into Puerto Rico, and then you see some cross-referencing here with the Negrish with the Y-C-H. And you can see these aren't just 
uh, individuals coming in as indentured servants. Uh, many of them are coming in with complete families, as you can see here going into Quebec. You see Basil, um, and you see Anna off to the right, and then you get into another spelling, and then you see Basil or Basil's family again. You see individuals going into Manitoba, Quebec. And here we see additional variations. Uh, this one's just coming to North America. We have an individual uh, going into Illinois, North America. And you can see, again, the variations in date. You've got 1778, 1776. Uh, you have one individual, Michael Niger, or Niger, going into Port Uncertain, 1788. Uh, Niger Nelly going into Iowa. You have uh, Alfred showing up in Illinois. And so these are 1800 so far. Uh, some of these names are difficult to pronounce, um, but then you get down to Negley or Nagel, Nagel uh, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Philadelphia, again, 1700s. Remember, there is a dynamic with revolutions going on in Europe at this time. So it's important to keep that in mind when you see certain names that pop up from different areas going to certain areas. And so then you have off to the right, you have Nick Lee, again, going into Boston, Philadelphia, significant uh, number going into that Upper East Coast area there. Then you have Negu going into New Orleans, Negra, and you have Negral going into the West Indies, Negri, Negra, so you see a, a number going into the West Indies and then into Kansas. And this is, again, this is 1921, so you can see that they were steadily coming. Now, what you might find is when individuals back then had names like Negro, uh, during that climate, it might not have been conducive for them to maintain that name. And so you might, if you're tracing family names and you get to something like that, it may be that the individual changed their name uh, because it serves as like a lightning rod and so you might find that and so you might also see these variations because some of the variations uh, give sort of a, a hidden dynamic going on and so you might not automatically think when you see negli or nego that it's uh, synonymous with negro and you can also see off to the left you see that variation of negus again but this one has two g's with it and continuing on, we have Negri going into Pensacola in the 1700s, Negrier going into Quebec. Then you have Negrin going into Philadelphia, 1817. Uh, another Negro, uh, Negropolis going into New York, Negu again, uh, Negus going into Boston, more Negus. You have Jonathan Negus, Stephen Negus, Thomas Negus. Uh, coming from the 1800s, 1600s, you have Jonathan Negus as a settler in Massachusetts, 1633. Some people might ask, why are the Negus uh, in America? It's very interesting. Uh, however, uh, they were here very early and settlers. And you can see going in 1774, you have Thomas going into Philadelphia. And for those who are not familiar, that is the name that goes along with Ethiopian royalty. And continuing on, you see Charles going into Philadelphia with the surname Niger or Nigir. You see Nigel going into Philadelphia. You see Negus with a different spelling again, like Goose this time. Again, a settler, 1620. And then you see Nigo, Nigri, you see Negra, several Negra. And Negra is also the feminine for Negro. So you see Negrier, and then you see again Anthony and Isabella and William Settlers, Virginia, 1621. Then you see off to the right Jonathan Kristen going into Philadelphia. You see Negley again or Negil. Uh, you see Nigellin or Nigellin, depending on how you're pronouncing that. Niger again, Niger. Nigel. So you see quite a variety here and again a substantial number coming in the uh, 1700s, 1600s. Now a number of individuals of course identify this name with Africa only and so you can see that this name is coming out of Europe 
and uh, coming in a variety of ways from a variety of directions. And so there is this stereotype in the mind, this schema related to what the settlers look like, what the Indians look like. And so you can see here that there are indicators that the individuals may not have looked the way people perceive them to look. Okay, so you have here going on, Nagil again, Negali going into Texas, you have Philadelphia, again, 1700s, 1700s. Uh, then you have going into uh, Carolina, you have going into New Orleans, again, these different spellings, Negron, you have several Negrones, and then you hit Negus again. And one thing to be on the lookout for is that you will see names with variations that are French that go to the Louisiana Territory ultimately. And so you may see other variations for the Northeast like German names more in the Northeast. And yes, you can see this is extensive and this is just a small portion here. So we're just looking at a sample. So you see Negli going into Philadelphia and that's 1700s. Uh, some later ones going into Arkansas, Neglish and Neglish, uh, going in in 1905. Then you have uh, one going into Maryland, a very complex spelling there. And it's uh, 1653, again, that's a settler. Uh, you have Nego going into Virginia. So that's a, a cross-reference uh, from what we saw when we were talking about the definition of the name. You see Negra, Negra again going into New Orleans and then you see that identification going into Peru 1552. And you see additional French spellings with the Negre uh, going into or Negri depending on how they're pronouncing that or Niger you could pronounce it a variety of ways going into New Orleans it's 1800s. Uh, you can see Negri going into America then you have Manitoba. Niga going into New Orleans, 1829, again, Negley, uh, Nigelin, Negelin. You have a variety of spellings here going on down, again, frequently in the 1700s. You have a lot going into New, New York, Pennsylvania. You have one going into Texas, and then you see a repeat of some of them, some cross-references there. And you can see here multiple cross references for Negrish, meaning that there were a number of things that were going on in terms of notations for this particular individual. So you have Maria and Michael, uh, you have Nicola, you have a variety there. And you can see that their files are cross referenced. And then you get down, you see more Negrish going to Quebec, Manitoba, and it goes on there. And so that seems to be a common place for this particular variation of that surname. And yes, the variations continue. So you have Jacob Neggs, 1709, again, coming very early. Uh, you have going into Puerto Rico, 1882. Uh, Negus coming uh, again early. So you have that 1642 cross reference there going into Boston. Negus going into Nova Scotia, 1749. Uh, you see the Negus again, and then you see Negi or Negi or Negi, depending on how they are pronouncing that. And you have America, Galveston, uh, several in the 1800s and 1900s there. And then you go over and you see again some cross referencing again with this particular spelling with the YCZ at the end and going into Quebec and you see going into New York also. And here you see additional variations. You have them going into New York, uh, Negas, uh, Negabauer, Negeli, Negellen, Negeler. So you have a variety here going from everywhere, from New Orleans to Kansas. And as we are almost wrapping this up, you can see uh, a variety here in terms of Nigeli or Nigel uh, coming in. You see all the way to the 1900s here that there are notations. You see the individuals going everywhere from Iowa to Virginia to New York. You even see a notation for an individual named Nigger Man. And so some individuals will you know, debate and argue that this doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, it means exactly what it looks like. So uh, you have additional ones 
uh, Negley and Nagola. You have a number of variety, you have a variety over here to the right. Uh, you have going into Negrier, again, uh, going into New Orleans, and that's that French uh, variation there. You have Negrillo uh, going into uh, Dominican Republic here. And so again, you have a variety going into New Spain, Negron, and you also have Negro Nell. Now it's important to note with this particular individual, when you see historical records about that particular person, one of the things you might see is that this person is identified as Nell the Negro and Negro Nell. So there seems to be some conflation with just simply identifying her as a Negro and then giving her that surname. So it's really interesting in terms of the history when you see records related to that person. This information is very important because there is an assumption and there are many assertions that all brown individuals who end up in America, that they all came directly from Africa. Uh, the variation, the new flip of that is that all brown people in America actually were already here in America. And there is an assertion that 98 percent of brown people in America who identify as African-American, uh, they actually are American Indian. Uh, there has been no data, verifiable, reliable, valid data to prove that particular assertion. However, of course, a number of individuals who are brown are from Africa and are from America. However, there was a substantial number of individuals coming from Europe who have that as a part of their lineage. It doesn't matter what they look like now. It doesn't matter what the phenotype is. Uh, what matters is, is that this was a part of the root. And so when you're trying to understand history, it's important that you not be too swayed by propaganda going in one direction or the other and just keep your mind open. And we are now wrapping up. One thing to keep in mind when you are looking at the research or doing what's called consuming research is to consider this. Individuals who are researching this information related to quote unquote black history or American history or world history, those individuals need to be willing to entertain a variety of perspectives. They need to be willing to look at the world through a number of lenses. And so one of the ways that you might be able to note that you are looking at some research where individuals are looking at things in a multifaceted way is that the individual researcher will look at dynamics related to Europe. They will look at the history related to Asia. They will look at the history related to Africa. They will look at the history related to America. They will consider all of those histories in coming up with their paradigms about history. Individuals who have a myopic focus and they only want to focus on one thing and keep you focused on one thing, those individuals will stop you from actually finding your ancestors. And so you need to keep an open mind and when you are consuming research, you need to keep an open mind about not only the content that you were receiving, but you also need to understand the messenger and every messenger is not the same. And part of the activity with the little girls that you see on the screen involved dealing with this dynamic of confirmation bias that people have uh, with this paradigm of everyone who is brown uh, is rooted in America. And when you see two braids, people think that automatically means that the person is an American Indian. And when you see a particular phenotype like the ones you see on the screen, there is this assumption that these individuals are definitely uh, quote unquote African American little girls. Or if people have the American Indian paradigm, they will assume that these little girls are American Indian. And what you have found is, and you can continue to do your research, there are individuals that look like people in America or in the Americas that are in Africa and uh, primarily in the Sudan. And so you can see a number of those individuals. Uh, but if you are listening to individuals who are telling you that uh, the history in America is not connected with the history of Africa or the history of Europe. Uh, those individuals are short sighted in terms of their assistance uh, with helping you to understand the totality of this very complicated situation related to those in America, regardless of what the phenotype happens to be. 
And all that is said to say you can't simply put an Indian headdress on little Riley and make him an Indian. Remember, knowledge is power. Take care and see you soon.